Okay, welcome back. Uh, I see a couple of comments here in the chat. Elijah says, the presence of an unrepentant sinner in the church is dangerous to the saints. Yeah, very true. Thank you for sharing. Hope says, in Christian counseling course, thought how to help people like him. I think it's a mental problem. Um, yes, Hope, it, it, it could be a mental problem, but it's also a, a, a problem where a person, see, the Bible teaches us that, um, you know, God gives us the ability or the strength to overcome every temptation that comes our way, right? There's no temptation that uh, we cannot overcome because of what Jesus did. So yes, there could be, uh, it could be a mental problem, but it could also be a, a, a place of not willing or not taking the stance of authority that God has given us and just letting life go by, uh, you know, just so that we can enjoy the pleasures of uh, the world. So, yeah, that's that combination. We will have to see that. Uh, now, if it's a mental problem, what we can do is we know that if he's he or she is willing to go for counseling, then they can continue in the church because they know we know that they are trying to change and they're making an effort. Uh, but if they are unwilling, again, um, there's nothing much that we can do. Right, so let's continue. We're almost uh, at the end of this chapter. Uh, so we were at grace. Grace must be given with truth. Right. So this this is very important. Right. That is the truth. That is grace. And can we tolerate sin in the name of love, grace, and being open-minded? No. Can we say, okay, uh, you know, it's okay to be gay, it's okay to be a lesbian, it's okay to watch pornography, it's all right, um, because God loves you, God's grace is upon you, and everything will be all right. And we can't tolerate sin just by, you know, just because of grace and love. The Apostle Paul clearly shows us that sin has to be addressed, has to be dealt with. And the local church must not turn a blind eye towards it. Right? We must not. Uh, we must address it. We we must we must make sure that things are all right, and the person is either getting help or uh, there's something that is done to protect the believers in the church. Right. Uh, finally, James two thirteen for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. So there's a question here. If a person is living in sexual sin, right, adultery, homosexuality, how would the local church work with such an individual, right? Now, one thing that we can do is say, for example, we know somebody who's living in sexual sin, a believer, but somewhere he or she is falling away we love the individual, but the sin is a sin, right? Uh, now, if the individual desires to be part of the local church, then he must abide with the word of God, be willing to change, be willing to remove sin out of their lives. Right? So that could involve counseling, that could involve uh, being part of small groups and uh, going to, you know, uh, learning from God's word continually, uh, asking, you know, uh, God to change your life. And, uh, and eventually, as we keep, you know, praying and seeking God, God will help us to overcome that sin. And as leaders, we can see it in people's lives. You will be able to also see it in people's lives, right? But... If they desire to be part of a local church and fellowship with the believers, but unwilling to submit to God's work, unwilling to change, unwilling to remove the sins from their life, we cannot have them in ongoing fellowship. It's stern. It sounds very. Uh, it sounds like the Apostle Paul is, uh, you know, going overboard, but he's not. Right. Two reasons, protect the church, two, iron sharpens iron. It will rub off on everyone. If you have one person who is jealous in the church and not willing to change or, or, or proud, the entire church, next thing we know, will 
be full of proud and jealous people must be willing to submit to God's word right mercy triumphs over judgment right God is a merciful God uh, yet we have to understand the dynamics of this right when we look at the Old Testament we see God was merciful but he also called sin a sin and there was judgment on the sin best example is Israel as a nation right this is the, I think the best example Israel they they sinned they went into bondage they were in Egypt in oppression God, in His mercy, brought them out of Egypt. What did they do? Continued in sin. Continued in adultery. Continued in sexual immorality. Continued in, uh, you know, uh, idol worship and all of this. What did God do? Okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. But eventually, God had to deal with it. And He said, okay, now I'm going to bring destruction upon you. And then came all the prophets, the, you know, Babylon, you know, Babylonians came, destroyed uh, the Jews, Assyrians came, they were always, uh, you know, under oppression. Now, whose fault is that? The Israelites. Do you think if the Israelites were people who would say, you know, go back to God and say, God, please forgive, we will turn from our ways, we will, we will do the right things, God would say, hey, I will bless you. The more you turn away from me, the more you, uh, you know, you are rebellious. The more I will, uh, I, I'll have to turn my face against you. But even through that, in the book of Jeremiah, I love that. Jeremiah is a time when, you know, he, he's he's prophesying before, during, and after the fall. So Jeremiah twenty nine is during the fall, meaning during. The time when the Assyrians are coming and attacking the Israelites, the Jews. And he's saying, oh, okay, Jews, you don't be worried. I have a plan for you. I have a plan to prosper you, to give you a good hope or a good future. You know, we very easily say these verses. Right? We, we can just, you know, declare it. It's nice. But what is the context? They are in judgment. Yet in that judgment, we see God's mercy. There's a reason why God says that. He says, for that, later on after 29, he says, for this to come upon you, turn from your ways. Turn from your evil ways. Return to the Lord, and you see what I can do for you. Right? So there is mercy, but there is also judgment. Right? And, and so I hope uh, we are clear on this. Uh, there will be seasons, there will be times, there will be people in our lives as leaders. We will have to make stern decisions. Do it in the right way. Do it with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay, so let's move on to chapter 6. Now, chapter 5, he's addressed sexual sin. Now, in this chapter, the Apostle Paul uh, is bringing his attention to two matters. Right, one is disputes between believers in the local church. There was already division. Now disputes, that means arguments and fights, and believers living free from sexual sin. Right, so two 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 matters he's talking about. First one is a problem. Second one is good. Right, he, he's talking about how some of the believers are already living free from sexual sin and how God can help us live. Uh, free from every sin, right? So let's look at that. Resolving disputes between believers. Uh, there's this whole thing about the judgment seat. Now, it's yeah, verse one. Let's read that portion. Uh, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world, and if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? 
right? Uh, I say, sorry, if, if then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that and that too before unbelievers. Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you to go to the law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Again, you know, you can see Paul here. He's he's so burdened by what's happening here, right? Uh, it's riddled with so many problems in the church. Division, sexual sin. Now there's people among the believers itself, right? No, they're, they're fighting, there's cheating, there's wrongdoing. Now, believers, what they're doing is they're taking matters to the civil court. Now, uh, in, in Greece, especially in Asia Minor, in Greece, they had something called as the Bima, which is the judgment seat, right? And I think there's a picture here. Yeah, right. So if you see this picture, this is uh, it, it's all in the open, right? So this is a, uh, it's like a court of law. And of course, this is not the, uh, this is many, many centuries later. So, uh, so you see here is a podium, right? And this podium here was where the main judge would stand or he would sit in this portion here, right? And then you've got this whole, structure here so people will be seated everywhere and you see this here they will have one person stand here on a raised podium here and then there will be another one either this side or the uh, mostly it's this side right towards this side of the picture so so what will happen is the main judge would be here and uh, the court proceedings one here the other person somewhere this side and the issue will be resolved out in the open. And it was a time where people would, it was a kind of an entertainment for people, right? Because legal matters are, you know, looked after here. So people would come, they will, oh, okay, nothing to do. Okay, let's go and see, hear the court. Two people are fighting against each other. It's a good entertainment. And I think it happens also even now, right? Have you seen, you know, two neighbors fighting and then everyone come and watch, stand and watch. Uh, and they're happy to see them through fighting. It becomes entertainment, right? Now imagine this. The Apostle Paul is saying, you have problems within the church. A believer is feeling wronged or cheated by another believer. Now what I am upset about is you are going to the court, which is this place, right? You're going here to solve your problems front of all these unbelievers sitting here, all mocking you, ridiculing you, and you all are fighting. And who are you? You're a Christian. What is the other person? Christian. What are you all fighting about? Something wrong that you all have done. So Paul is very upset. That's why he says, verse 5, see, I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between the brethren? Why do you want to take matters to the court as believers, but you can solve the matter within the church? Is there not one wise person to solve the problem in the church? And then you go out and you go stand in front of these unbelievers. What kind of a testimony are you, you know, portraying there? Now, why is Paul emphasizing this? Because Paul himself you know, in Athens, he stood in front of the Aeropagus in Mars Hill and he preached. He has been in front of many, many courts, right? So he knows what happens. He has first hand experience. He knows what it is to stand there and everyone mocking, making fun, ridiculing. He has first hand experience. So he's got that picture in his mind and he's saying, Imagine this two believers standing in front of unbelievers mocking ridiculing and 
and uh, as a place of entertainment and these two believers are fighting for something what kind of testimony are we proving to be in the city of Corinth so he's upset right he the apostle Paul he's pointing out to the fact that we will judge the world and even angels when a time has come so should we not then uh, with the wisdom and revelation God has given to us be able to judge and resolve matters within ourselves so Paul is saying see God is calling us to judge angels and judge people uh, uh, in the world uh, uh, and when a time will come we will judge even angels and people and what is this we're saying here? Can we not ask the Holy Spirit? Are there no leaders in the church who can resolve this matter? Is it necessary to take it to the court? Right? Uh, why is Paul so upset? Again, first of all, all the problems that were happening within the church, he was upset with that. But he says, okay, since it's within the church, we can resolve it. Let's find out a way. And, and now, another problem. You're not taking it outside the church. You're supposed to be a testimony to the people outside. Now, what are you showing them? Hey, these Christians are fighting with each other. Right? Uh, just a side note on saints and angels. As believers, we are saints. And we have a much more privileged position than angels. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. God has set us as an example for angels, two angels. Can you believe that? Can you picture this? Right? God has set us as an example to angels. Uh, and angels desire to look into and discover the plan of God for us who are the redeemed. We will reign with Jesus during the millennium. Uh, and, and the Bible does not disclose in what way we will judge angels, but we know that we have a better place than the angels. We are created in his image and that there will come a time we will judge them. Right? Now, how we will judge them, on what we will judge them, that has not been mentioned. Right? Uh, but we are, the point is we are more superior than the angels. God has given us, made us in his own image. We are his children. To none of his angels, he said, uh, you know, the book of Hebrews talks about it, right? Uh, the, to none of his angels, he said, come and sit at my right hand and see, and, and see I will give you the nations. And uh, to none of his angels, he has said, I have, uh, I'll give you my Holy Spirit who will, you know, we are in a higher position than the angels. So Paul is saying, it's okay. It's okay to, uh, you know, about civil courts and legal authority. It's all there, right? But as far as possible, get things resolved within the church between believers. Now, Paul himself has stood in many courts, right? He was wronged. What did he say uh, when they were beating him up uh, in Acts 22? He says, uh, how can you hit a Roman citizen? How can you beat me up and put me in a prison, uh, knowing that I'm a uh, that I'm a Roman citizen? And he says, I appeal to Caesar. Right. So Caesar was the highest level. Now the real issue was here. It's not an issue because they are Gentiles troubling Paul, doing something that is right. He's not doing something unlawful. Right. As a Roman citizen, as a Jew, he is sharing the gospel, and it's not. Uh, it's not something unlawful. He's just sharing uh, what he what he believes. If they don't like it, they can just walk away. But for, for for Paul, they're saying, "Why are you, you know, torturing? Why are you beating us up? Why are you putting us into prison? They are just preaching something. You want to believe, believe it." And so that's why he says, "We are wronged, and I appeal to Caesar." But here in Corinth is the dispute between two believers. Both are believing in Jesus and they're fighting against each other. So that Paul is saying, no, we must learn to settle things on our own. Right now, let's look at what's happening around us, right? Uh, in a season that we are in right now, 
are there believers who have wronged other believers and they're fighting cases in the court yes is it right no why because if there are if they are truly believers they will be able to settle those matters outside of the court but if they are so called christians or just christians by name just because we have a name peter paul doesn't mean we are believers right peter may be fighting against paul in the court just because they have two christian names doesn't mean they are believers right so we may have a you know a thought may a thought may come hey uh, but peter and paul are uh, you know filed a case against each other in the court for some land issue or land dispute what about that their names are peter and paul but they are not believers they just christian names they have not truly accepted what the message or, or or the gospel of jesus they've not truly become believers because if they were they will settle this matter in the right way they will not drag the person to the court right so it could also be that one person is right the other person is wrong the other person feels cheated uh so we must even if things are gone to the court we do it in a in a in a more decent way right or or in a more in a way that is uh you know making peace right uh, and, and so when we as believers in jesus christ are called to be peacemakers let's do it among ourselves let's try and resolve matters among ourselves but it's sad to see when two believers fight and especially in court and you know there is a, there are people around and uh, we are being a bad testimony right now i'm not saying it's not going to happen we will see that happening uh but we can avoid it so we can definitely avoid it uh let's go down right verse 8 <clears throat> no you yourselves do wrong and cheat and you do these things to your brethren do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived now he goes on with a list neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of god and such were some of you but you were washed but you were sanctified but you were justified in the name of the lord jesus look at this list right paul here he's reminding that he's reminding the believers what kind of life you are lived right now this is not a, a completely like a, a complete list but he just whatever has come to his mind he's saying these he's saying these things and he's saying these people will not inherit the kingdom of god right so what does he say there fornicators that is prostitutes did corinth have prostitutes plenty thousands of them idolaters worshippers of false god was there false god yes aphrodite and other gods of their own understandings adulterers adultery yes it was there homosexuals yes definitely uh, you know male and male female and female male prostitutes yes and sodomites which is a generic term for homosexual practice right uh, and then thieves greedy drunkards revilers that is abusers and people who slander and curse people and then extortioners people who cheat and swindle and are thieves now this list is a strong list but paul is saying here you were in all of this right that means what when i came to you a couple of years back and when i preached the gospel to you you had all these things inside you right but the moment you heard the gospel and you accepted the lord jesus christ as your personal savior 
what has happened you have been washed you have been this has happened you have been washed you have been sanctified you have been justified in the name of the lord jesus christ so he's reminding them you see how beautifully paul is trying to bring this across he's not saying he's not saying you know you were fornicators adulterers or, or, or you know covetous drunkards revilers and now you are going back to that paul is not saying that no uh, he's saying you were that but now you're washed redeemed and justified in the name of the lord jesus right uh, but were they idolatrous were they adulterous there was but paul is bringing them to their real identity right he's trying to tell them hey you were in all of this now there is some of it still there but he's he's not thinking of that he's saying now you are washed you are sanctified you are justified in the name of jesus so behave that way right this is a wonderful news that you know washed sanctified and justified by the spirit of god what a powerful you know what a powerful thing as leaders right he reminds them of their past but he also reminds them that even though you are in sin now but in god's presence you are you are sanctified you are justified you are redeemed so behave that way right behave in a manner that is pleasing to god right uh, and if the lord did it then to those people he still does it today when we may have sin in our life one of the things we can do is we can say god redeem me save me from this and the prayer that we make he is able to wash us he is able to sanctify us just like he did for them right and this is a wonderful example for us as leaders don't rem you know we may re think when we are ministering to people we may have this habit of thinking oh hey you know you are like this you are like this are you like this even now no uh, we we must come out of that we must say even though you were like this now you are washed you are redeemed you are sanctified right uh, and so paul is reminding the believers i'm sure as a reader they would have thought oh yes we were all of this even now sometimes we are you know uh, proud or covetousness or greedy or angry and uh, you know living in immorality but paul is saying we are sanctified justified redeemed we are washed we are cleansed sure it would have touched their lives then he goes on to say how we can stay away from sexual sin now he's giving them a background right the corinthian church had come out from all of this and he presents some powerful truth uh, on how we can stay away from sexual sin right so this portion here was 12 to 20 um, let's let's read that all things are lawful for me but not all things are helpful all things are lawful for me but i will not be brought under the power of any foods for the stomach and stomach for foods but god will destroy both it both it and them now the body is not for sexual immorality but for the lord and the lord for the body and god raised up the lord and will raise us up by his power do you not know that your bodies are members of the are members of christ shall i then take the members of christ and make them members of a harlot certainly not or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her for the two he says shall become one flesh but he who is joined to the lord is one spirit with him flee sexual immorality every sin that a man does is outside the body but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body or do you not know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have from god and you are not your own for you were bought with a price therefore glorify your body with with which 
Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Right. So Paul is, you know, giving us some practical keys here. First, he's brought his attention to them, saying that you are already justified, already washed. Now he's saying here, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. Right. Which means all things are not profitable. Paul is addressing sexual sin and he's uh, using this word, especially the use of a prostitute. Right now, for example, right, there's a believer in Corinth and somewhere he or she has, you know, allowed the enemy to bring temptation into their mind. And he goes or she goes and he or she, they can go hire a prostitute for one night and then come back. Now, in Corinth, it's acceptable. Why? Well, because it was a business and it's acceptable. Right? Uh, nobody will come and say, oh, you see. no. Using the services of a prostitute was culturally acceptable in Corinth. The city was known for it. But Paul is calling believers not to be controlled by cultural practices. Right? Now, for example, now, right now, in a world that we are in, it may be socially or culturally okay or acceptable for a man, you know, for a boy and a girl to live with each other, live in relationships before marriage. Acceptable, right? Uh, oh, Pastor, we are in 2022. Please behave like a modern pastor. I don't be like these. It's not 1960s. It's to 2022. Yeah. Grow up. It's what's happening around us. Now, if there are two believers living that way, first thing I would say is it's wrong in the eyes of God. Right? Why? Because it's not what God wants. But is it culturally acceptable? Yes. You go look for a house. They say, okay, uh, you know, me and my boyfriend or my girlfriend, we are living together. They'll give you. Nobody's going to stop you. Right? They're acceptable. Nobody's going to pass judgment also. Even if they pass, nobody cares. But what about God? Is it right in the sight of God? Right? So Paul is trying to tell the believers, now, hiring a prostitute for one night may be all right acceptable in Corinth, but you see what is acceptable in the eyes of God, right? Uh, sometimes we, uh, you know, in the West, there are there's this whole thing of uh, people, uh, you know, partners having children. They're not even married. They have children. They have a family without marriage. It's normal. In the West now, it's normal. It's completely normal, right? Uh, or even some malpractices in business. It's, it's normal. Now, Paul is saying not everything is beneficial. So we will not be brought under the control of anything that is displeasing to God. So here's the thing. You and I as believers must not see what is happening around us. Hey, he's doing it so when I can do it. No. Is it in line with the word of God? You know, is it is it pleasing God? Is it honorable to God? Right. Uh, and when it comes to church, uh, and even outside church in the workplace, is it honorable to God? If I is it honorable the way I speak? You know, in in office, it's okay to backstab and to to ridicule, to mock people, and it's a it's a lifestyle. Right, but it, nobody may judge us in the workplace. But is it honourable to God? So we are called to to do what is pleasing in God's eyes, and not as what is popular opinion. And but popular opinion will keep changing, right? Uh, and now with this whole um, you know digital world that we are living in, social media. I won't believe you know some of the things that I see 
one of my friends shared this with me. You know, they put up, I don't know, what is this thing about the WhatsApp status? It's good. Well, I don't know. I don't have, I don't use all that. But, you know, my friends, one of a couple of friends of mine was saying, I just happened to see that and he's written, you know, there are, there are times when they say, just bought a new pant, you know, just, just going for a bike ride. I think to myself, they don't have any other work, is it? Or, or is it is it normal like to do these things? I don't know. So I keep telling, I, I keep telling some of my friends, is it normal? I say yes, yeah, normal. So I just sneezed. I just finished my lunch. They put it in the group. No, there's nothing wrong in it. But what I'm trying to bring across is that is it is it something that is beneficial? Like now, it is. If there's something important I want to convey, then all right. But okay, if you are doing it on your WhatsApp status, please go ahead and do it. Nothing wrong in it. It's not a sin. But it's not. I mean, for me, is it beneficial? Is it something that is going to help me? Right. Verse thirteen and fourteen. Okay, Mangi, I think you have a. Uh, you've raised your hand. Yes, go ahead, Mangi. Thank you, sir. Um. I have a question. Yes. Um, we, okay, the world we live in is a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a totally different place and we have many cultures and many practices. Some of them are, are wrong, some, some, of, some of them are, are good. And as believers, here we are presented with a Corinthian example of how they, they did life and how they lived. And Today here in, a, for example, here in Cape Town, um, our culture is different from the culture in India, uh, where things like uh, gay marriage here is, is accepted. People uh, see how, how a woman marrying a woman or a man marrying another man. Um, so how do we balance? that for example if someone comes from india to visit the church here and they see people on the road holding hands how do we balance that because you cannot go to them and say oh stop that that is bad to get stoned mm. thank you yes that's that's a wonderful question yes mangi so yes in culturally right like you were saying there uh now for example in india very rarely you'll find you know partners getting, uh, you know, having children and raising a family even before marriage. Very rare. It's not a culture here. It's not yet here. Uh, but we do see the live-in relationships starting. So Mangi's thing, uh, you know, point was in, in Cape Town, uh, they, you the, you know, lesbian or homosexuality uh, is common. So you can find a man and a man holding hands and walking. So how do we respond to that, right? Now, firstly is... Uh, if they are not believers, Maggie, we share, if we get an opportunity, we share with them the gospel, right? Just a simple gospel. And we, uh, and then we share with them, what is God, what is God's design, right? Uh, now, I'm not saying that immediately they will believe, right? You share with them. Uh, and then you you see whether they, they are able to receive it. It may take some time. Uh, now, if they are unbelievers and they're not willing to listen, we have to move on, right? We cannot, you know, say, uh, you know, if they're not willing to accept it, we have to move on, right? Uh, but if they are believers and you see that they are living this continual, you know, this sinful life and they're open about it because the culture is that way, then we can, you know, if we are in a position, we can tell them, hey, this is wrong. What does God's word say? God's word says this, that, uh, you know, I made man and woman, and uh, that is God's design. And uh, and I think that we have, uh, you know, diverted from what God has, uh, you know, really wanted for his children. Uh, and so we bring correction to them. Uh, now, again, when we do that, we do it in love. But we also do it with a sternness. We are bringing truth, the truth of God's word, with the grace of God, right? Now, 
there are few times people will listen remember when we we are talking to people about god's word it's the word that can touch them right so it may take time sometimes it can just happen immediately right and uh, you know uh, i remember maggie um, uh, uh, many many years back i think 2018 we came to uh, me and uh, as a family we visited uh, johannesburg and we also came to cape town and i do i did remember you know uh, there was this uh, very very good gentleman who took us from the airport to the hotel and uh, <clears throat> while we were talking he was saying uh, you know he goes to a certain church there close by and uh, uh, he asked us, what do you do? And we told them, you know, we serve in a church. We just come here to visit a few friends. And uh, and then he began to ask a lot of questions. And he said that, uh, you know, he was not married, but he uh, had a child and he and his partner are living together. And uh, they had, I think, a six-year-old child or something. Yeah. And so he said, I have to go back home quickly and then drop my child. And then he said to me, no, we are not married, right? Uh, now it gave me an opportunity, right? Uh, so I just shared with him. I said, "See, we know about God. You know what God's word is." Uh, so I just began to share, like, just common things, and uh, he was really touched, right? Now I'm not saying it happened. I also shared to other people. It didn't. They were not touched. But this one, this one person, he was really touched. He began to tear up as he was driving the car and dropping us to the hotel. And he said, I thank God that I met you. I want to make some changes in my life. I feel that emptiness. I, I want to. Uh, and I still keep in touch with him. And he, he, I think it was a couple of years later, a year or so, he said, I will save up money and I will get married to this person. And I will do it the right way. And I'd ask God for forgiveness for him. He just it, it just happened that way, right? So the Holy Spirit is and God is above our culture or things that people have set, social, social things that we see. He's above all of that, right? So this man has been in you know uh, Johannesburg all his life. The culture he knows it, it's fine. He can be that way. Nobody's judging him. But the Holy Spirit brought conviction to him that day, right? And now he's married. He got married, and uh, uh, and he did send me these photos of his marriage. So, so God is above the cultures. He's above the you know norms that are happening around us. The Holy Spirit can bring conviction, and uh, and so Mangi, I hope that answers your question, right? Uh, we may not see it always, but we can see it. At times, we will be able to see it. Uh, God is able to bring courage. See, His Holy Spirit is a spirit of conviction, right? He will bring conviction. The, the Holy Spirit reveals the truth of God's word into a person's heart. So as believers, we can just share it and be there for them. If they are willing to change, help them out, right? Uh, so, uh, so th yeah, thank you, Mangi. Yes. Yes, Christopher, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, uh, ask this question with regards to uh, a person who sins and um, you know, gets asked for dependence. Mm. Um, so God will 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 uh, you know, wash him. He will I mean, he'll get, he will be washed. He'll be justified and he'll be sanctified. Mm. Um, is that correct? So in that sense, um, he's. Um, He's forgiven completely. Yes. Uh, so what happens when he commits a sin again? Um, you know, because he's really challenged, challenged with that sin. Mm. Again, he falls into this this uh, this state of sin. Mm. Um, I guess my question is, um, um, how often does this does this sort of um, does this happen? You know, this this particular process of asking for dependence, genuinely ask, asking for our dependence, then getting watched, getting justified, getting sanctified, mm -hmm. and then uh, falling again. OK. Yeah. So Christopher, here's the thing. Once we are, you know, once we have asked God to come into our life, we have, first thing is, we are, our spirit 
is changed, our inner man. Second Corinthians 5.17 happens, right? We pray, okay, God, come into my heart, make me a new person. I believe that you have washed me from all my sins, and I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Second Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. So this person has become a new creation, right? His spirit, the Holy Spirit comes inside him. He's a new creation. He's no longer... Uh, 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 in the devil's, uh, in, in the kingdom of the devil, but he's brought into the kingdom of light, right? He's God's child. Now, as God's children, there are certain things we must do, right? One, Romans 12. Romans 12 says, be, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So what he must do, he knows, okay, hey, the Lord Jesus has cleansed me from all unrighteousness. I'm forgiven. I'm saved. I'm a child of God. But the mind is still natural. The spirit is, you know, a new person. But the mind, the thinking is natural. I may look at a person and, you know, still get angry. I may look at, uh, uh, you know, wrong things and think of sexual things. It's still natural. The thinking is natural. I may still want to back answer, or I may still walk in pride, right? So what is happening here? My spirit is changed. I've received salvation. I've received forgiveness of sins, but my mind is not yet transformed. Now we know that the devil attacks the mind, right? He brings to the mind. He says, okay, why don't you do this? Why don't you get, you know, go and tell this person, this or why don't you you know he brings pride into the mind he, he so the devil attacks the mind right so this person has to go through the process of renewing the mind and it's something that he has to do it's a step that he or she have to take and when they take that step the holy spirit is there to help them out right now for example uh if I'm right, just giving an example. If there's an alcoholic, he likes to drink, but he has given his life to Christ. There's a change in him. But in his mind, he keeps thinking, oh, I want to have a drink. He has to renew his mind. He has to say, no, now I'm a child of God, so I can avoid this. I can, Lord, give me the strength that I will not overcome to this temptation. I will not fall into this temptation. I will overcome it. Right? So there's a, there's a thing that that person has to take. Right? Now, if I don't take the authority, I will fall into sin. And then again, I'll ask for forgiveness. Again, I'll fall into sin. You know, and what's happening here is 1 John chapter, I just looked up that verse, 1 John chapter 3, verse 6 says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Okay, No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Look at this verse. 1 John 3 verse 6. No one who believes in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Then there's another verse. I forget the, the chapter and verse, but it says that uh, if one is continuing to sin, you know, uh, there is no more sacrifice left for him. There's nothing more that can be done for him. Because the sacrifice is already done, right? And then I think it's in the book of Colossians. Yes, uh, uh, just give you this verse, and then we can close. Uh, in Colossians, yeah, Colossians chapter three. Paul is writing to the Colossians, and he says here from verse eight. Uh, to verse 14, maybe when you have time, you can read that. He's telling the believers, you have to put on or put off certain things. What? Malice, rage, anger, slander, filthy language. Put it off from you. And then he goes on to say, put on, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience, forgive one another, not a bit. So he's he's giving a command here. He, he's saying you have to put off and you have to put on. Uh, and, and so if we are continuing to sin, then we're not making an effort. 
uh, it says there's a saying, right? Uh, a fool falls into the same pit twice, or digs into digs a hole and falls into the same pit. So, Christopher, to answer your question, yes, salvation happens. It's happened once, but if we are not doing these things, putting off and putting on, if we are not making an effort to overcome the things of the flesh, if we are not renewing our mind, then it's only going to be uh, a whole process. You know, it's just going to be a cycle. Ask for forgiveness and then sin. Ask for forgiveness and sin. Eventually, it's not going to do any good for us. We're not going to grow into what God wants us to do. And uh, I wish I could remember that other verse. I think it's, yeah, well, I got it here. It's Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, verse 26. It says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Right. So if we deliberately continue sinning, there's no sacrifice left. So, right. So uh, I hope that answers a bit of your question, Christopher. Right. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, let's close in prayer. We've crossed our time. We'll continue this chapter next week, and then we'll move on to the next chapter. Let's close in prayer. Right. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. And thank you for all that we have learned to God. And all that we do, Lord, we pray that we will walk in your grace, walk in your anointing, and live lives that is pleasing and holy and acceptable in your sight, oh God. We pray for each and every student, even as they continue to learn throughout all the courses, uh, that you will bless them, fill them with your spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great week ahead. I'll see you next Monday. God bless.